This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here. Go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. It's no different than being a professional baseball player. You can't be a one-trick pony. You have to be a five-tool player in order to succeed in this game. This is the Power Producers Podcast. Production redefined. Are you ready to feel the power? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. We have got a very special guest with us today. Mr. Renato Robinson, I don't even know what state you're from, man. You got agencies all over the place looking at your uh, at your website. I appreciate that, man. I'm originally from North Carolina. I thought so, Charlotte, right? Yes, but you've got you've got multiple locations, do you not? Yep. So um, I'm from Wilmington originally. Uh, offices are in Charlotte. Main office is in Fort Mill, South Carolina, which is a which is a bedroom community of Charlotte. North Carolina, and then we have another satellite office in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Got it. Cool deal. So um, why don't you take us back to the beginning, man? I've heard your story before. It's a good one. But why don't you tell everybody how you got to where you're at quick? Yeah, course, absolutely. You got a bit of history with that, so you can take your time a little bit. I think well, it resonate well. Good deal, man. Well, hey, uh, first and foremost, I appreciate you guys having me on having me on your podcast. Totally honored. Um so, so let's go back to the beginning. So um, I started my career uh, working and I, I moved to from Wilmington to Atlanta in 1995 to go to uh, college. Um, the town I'm from had a population of a thousand before I left. It was 998 after my brother and I moved down to Atlanta. Um, we, we, we went there, lost our minds, started partying, uh, didn't finish school. <laughs> Happened upon, you know, just odd and in warehouse jobs, um, came across this one job to where uh, I was working for a rug importer and I was their FedEx guy. Um, I was responsible for shipping all of the salesman samples of area rugs and curtain throws to salesmen all over the U.S. Um, that job was going nowhere. And I got passed up for a job in their customer service unit. And so I was like, I, I need something better than this. So one Monday, I decided not to go into work, uh, put on a suit, went to a staff and service and took their typing test, uh, blew the typing test out of the water because I took typing in high school. Um, they, they said, Renato, you, you passed the typing test. What type of job are you looking for? And I said, it really doesn't matter. I just want something in an office to where I wouldn't have to be in a warehouse. And I want a said, job yeah. typing. I give me a job typing. Exactly. Give me a job typing. I'm, I'm tired of doing the warehouses in the back of these trucks. So, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it was nuts, man. And so they said, well, we, you're in luck. We got a job that, that's working in an office. It'll still be manual labor. But what you will be doing is uh, boxing up files and sending them to archives. It's a three month assignment. Do you want it? And I said, yep. So I get there. They put me in this 20 by 20 room. Uh, racks, four high, fill of boxes. Um, it took me two weeks to knock all of those boxes out. And they were they were they were really impressed with me. And they said, "Well, we'll keep you on for the rest of your assignment. We're going to put you in the claims mail unit, index and workers comp files, and figuring out who the adjuster is." So I did that for the the, the next two and a half months. Um, the lady that was working in the mail room approached me and said, "Hey, I'm I'm getting ready to." get me a desk job and they need someone to be the mailman over these five floors. So I interviewed for it. Uh, the time at the time, the company was St. Paul insurance company. 
was in Georgia. Um, it had 500 employees over five floors. They hired me to be the, the sole mailman for that. And I did that for two years until one day an, uh, an underwriter approached me and said, hey, how would you think? Well, what are your thoughts on being an assistant underwriter? And I said, I know nothing about insurance. And she said, well, that's OK. We'll teach you and we'll feed you sweets and chips on Fridays, whatever you like. So sign me up. So I think it, I did the that. mail job, the mail job sounds like something sign I would up. roll with for a little while. That's like <laughs> better call Saul before he turned into an attorney, man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, you know, I tell people all the time it's it's almost like that movie with Michael J. Fox, The Secrets of My <laughs> Success. Um, similar to that. I, I had fun doing it. I would zip around with a cart on every floor. I would sit and talk to people, you know, constantly, see how their day was going, see what they were doing. I knew everything about everyone. I knew everything about the company, every department they had. It, it was a real cool job. And so, you know, that's what uh, Newman on Seinfeld says. When you control the mail, you control information. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I was, hey, look, I, I was knowing who, who was getting canned, who was coming aboard. I, I, I knew everything, man. It, it, it was great. And so, you know, they, they put me in that in the Ocean Marine underwriting unit as an assistant underwriter. And every year I got promoted until I got into their underwriter training program. Um, went through their underwriter training program and became a bona fide underwriter in 2003. Um, started marketing the territory. They gave me uh, the Carolinas, Florida, Tennessee, Georgia as my territory. And I was going out with, with underwriters in different units, you know, cross-selling ocean marine types of products. One day I got to the Charlotte office and said, huh, they don't have an ocean marine underwriting unit here. I'm from North Carolina. Good deal. All right. So, uh, yep, assistant underwriter. And then uh, every year I got promoted until I went into their underwriter trainee program in 2003. Um, became a full blown underwriter right after that. And they gave me the territory of the Carolinas, Georgia and Florida, going around cross selling ocean marine products with with uh, other other underwriters from other different business units. And I was having fun doing it. Um, everywhere I'd go, agents would be like, man, you, you really have a great sales mentality. Why don't you go to the carry? Why don't you come to the agency side and be a producer? You know, you, you hear it once, you're like, okay, you know, they, they might be blowing smoke. You, you hear it two or three times, you know, you, you start thinking there may be some validity to this. And so, uh, started the process of, of, of interviewing with different agents. Mm -hmm. And, um, after I started interviewing, I really didn't see anything I liked. And so in 2015, um, I made the move to uh, start my own insurance agency from scratch, working out of my house. Um, I can recall the days of my son. He was six years old at the time, playing under my desk while I'm <laughs> cold calling. Uh, I still love cold calling. I, I love the thrill of the chase. Uh, fast forward five years later, it's it's four of us, and we have a main office and two satellite offices. So definitely blessed, and 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 appreciate you guys giving me a chance to hear my story. That's cool, man. I mean, uh, you know, it, it takes me about 10 times to hear in something before I decide to act on it. But similar story, you know, <laughs> I, and I will just go ahead. And I'm going to call you out for this, man. The absolute worst thing yeah. I heard you say in all of this is that job indexing workers comp claims sounds horrible. <laughs> I mean, that, what a nightmare. That, that's enough oh. to make you want to be a producer, even if I didn't have a sales mentality. I couldn't handle it. I tell you what, man. It, it 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 was it was a it was definitely eye opening and at one part of my mailman career I did interview uh, to go into the claims unit and 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 I have to applaud those guys you know they they take flack from everywhere and you know it, it's it's definitely a, a thankless job and I, I, my hats oh. are off to to anyone that does claims yeah worst job ever but, but worst I, job ever yeah. Yeah. Ne next, yeah. But the sales yeah, next thing. indexing workers complex. <laughs> no thanks. That's right. Next indexing workers complex. So talk That's about right. your agency a little bit, man. What do you guys <laughs> do? Um, you know, predominantly what's your mix so, look like? Uh, what do you what are you writing? Yep. So we're we're eighty percent commercial, uh twenty percent personal lines. Um that eighty percent commercial book consists of contractors, um, manufacturers. Distributors, trucking, limos, restaurants um, still have a, a, a good bit of marine business, um, given that's my background. 
And then, you know, on the personal side, home, auto, motorcycle, RV, personal articles, you name it. What was the biggest challenge aside from your son tying your shoestrings together underneath your desk while you were cold calling at home? What was the biggest <laughs> challenge when you started up, you know, your agency? Uh, it probably has to be the next biggest challenge was him unplugging the phone while he was tying the <laughs> shoes. <laughs> exactly. No, uh, well, seriously, I, I think that the biggest challenge was 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 accessing, getting access to markets. Right. Um, you, you know, starting out, and, and I hear this from a lot of agents. It's it's tough when you're trying to build a book of business and go after the, the larger national carriers who want a certain volume when you might not meet that certain volume. And you know, some of those carriers don't allow brokerage, so it's it's like, well, well what do you do? You know, you, you have to adopt and adapt and survive. So. Um, that by far. And then, you know, j just trying to figure out the ins and outs of the sales process. You know, un underwriting is, is is a total different beast, in my opinion, from what I've seen on the sales side. So um, just. I, I agree with you, man. And, you know, it's interesting because I really think that having an underwriting background, you have a lot a leg up on a lot of people that are producers out there. They might not think that. But they're also naive in the fact that their first sale has got to be to the underwriter, or there's nothing that to sell to the client. And if you don't, and if you don't have a good submission, if you don't have a good case, if you don't have a narrative and a premium versus loss summary and all of the other things, and look, I'm not saying that you need to handle every, hand an underwriter a pristine account every time. Most of the time, our agency handles something mm -hmm. is far from pristine. Mm -hmm. That's our business model. We're looking for uh, workers' comp issues. We're looking for something that has some hair on it. But our underwriters know we're going to accurately represent what that is. And they know that we're in mm -hmm. partnership with them. We, they know that we understand that they have to make money too. So it's not always about us going after them and saying, hey, by the way, you know, here's a piece of garbage and I want you to cut your rate by 20%. You can't have everything. And so you have to be able to sell that underwriter and do your due diligence and put a good package together to yes. submit to them. And then you're going to have something good to go out and talk to your clients about. If you are an underwriter and you know what you wanted to see, you're way off. You're way better off than a producer who's never sat in that desk before, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, that, that that's definitely key. Having that having that underwriting background to where you can you can translate an underwriting message to a customer who might not understand the insurance process that that goes a long way and then vice versa you know everyone here has taken the the same approach that I do to where we we pre-screen we pre-qualify and by the time we pre-qualify an account we know which carrier we're going to and you know time is money and and no one has time you know to waste on money or anything nowadays and so by the time we go to an underwriter we make sure we have at least 85% of what they need because we don't want to spend their wheels because they, you know, just like us, they probably have another 15 to 20 agents they're working on. And, and, you know, with COVID right now and everyone working from home, what's going to get your submission to the top of the stack. And, you know, they're looking for, they're looking for the cream of the crop, the rights. That's all it is, man. And it, that comes with experience and relationship building and all that goes into that. But you're right. The number one goal of any agent should be to get to the top of that stack. And that's its own art and science. Yes, it you is. know, there's trust me, I've done I've done a pretty good job in that over the years. I learned early, but I've done a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if there's a piece of advice that I think people can take from what you've said so far and what we've discussed. That's it. You know, underwriting relationships should not be adversarial. No. At the end of the day, you know, they're responsible for your revenue stream just as much as the client. Is. Absolutely. So you better be you better be romancing them and, and sending them edible arrangements or whatever Absolutely. else every now and again, because otherwise, you know, they can control whether or not you hit that big pop or not. That That is certainly true. You know, I used to have a saying when I was an underwriter was, you know, I got I got 100 applications here I can work on. What makes your application more special than this next one that I have? And a lot of times, like I said, it, it just boiled down to who who was giving me the best relationship, who could, who would I know the trust that, that's, that would give me a full submission and could get back to me quickly with everything I need in order to get it done for them. And here's a question. So here's a question I have, because this is something that I've always done. It just made sense to me. 
that this is the way it should be done. I don't know if my underwriters like it or hate it. I've honestly never asked anybody until right now. Okay. But we we don't just send submissions in, right? Because we want to have the conversation ahead of time. Right. So most of the time we're pre-qualifying by having that conversation with the underwriter saying, hey, look, here's what I've got. Mm -hmm. I don't have a ton of information yet, but this is the class of business. This is what I understand the losses to look like. Is this something that if I'm able to put it together, like you know we will, mm -hmm. that you would be willing to entertain? And I think that solves a lot of problems too. We we take, I, I just don't like the marketing process in an independent agency as far as how we go to market, especially if I won't name their names, but I do love taking business from them. Mm -hmm. You shot, they shotgun the market every year. Every year. If you go if you go to 20 different underwriters, 19 of them lose. You're a moron. That's right. You're not, yes. You're, you're, you're just never going to have that credibility. And then what's going to happen? The underwriter who gave you the price or gave you the deal because you didn't sell value is going to get off the risk at some point, And you're going to need one of the other 19, and they're nowhere to be found. So when, in, in our agency, most of the time, well, number one, we're never going to go to market every single year. Right. Small bit, small business may be different, just because there's some automations that are involved with that now with some of the tools that are available to mm -hmm. us. But if you're a, if you're a middle market account, you come into our agency, it's a three year commitment on the front end. Right. For a lot of reasons, but underwriters understand and they know that you have a job to do. But if you're transparent with them, if you talk to them and you say, "Look, here's what I'm looking to do." This is where I think we need to be in terms of price. Mm -hmm. If you need if, if you need to be on the high end of that, I'm perfectly fine with it. I get it. I understand where the hair is. And I'm going to commit that we'll leave this with you for three years. But in three years, I have to go out and do due diligence in the marketplace. I'm not telling you I'm moving the account, but I'm going to go out and market it to see if the pricing is in line with what other people have. And I'm also going to tell the same thing to the carriers that we're going to. Yeah. I'm never going to go to more than two or three because there's just no point it's in not. it. And, you know, and, and I'm going to tell those carriers, hey, look, this is a very loyal client. They've been with carrier A for the last three years. I'm doing my due diligence in the marketplace. I don't want you to waste a ton of time. I want you to look at it. If it's something you think you can be competitive on, I'm agnostic to which carrier we go with based on what the terms and conditions are in the pricing. If you if you come in and everything lines up, yeah, we've got a great relationship, mm -hmm. but if you're going to save me 25% on a half a million dollars, I love the underwriter, but I'd rather just send her a really nice parting gift and take that 125,000 in savings Absolutely. and move it over to the other place. It, 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 I just don't think that people have the ability to handle and when I say people, I'm talking about the people on the agency side, producer side, or or that marketing position, the agency, they don't have the ability to have the direct conversation because they don't like confrontation or they're afraid that they're going to make somebody mad or hurt their feelings or whatever else. When honestly, it's quite the opposite. If you do have that conversation and you're confident when you do, you're going to have a lot more respect from that underwriter and appreciation that you shot them straight. Absolutely. You, you know, w when we onboard a carrier or if if we already have that carrier and I'm meeting an underwriter for the first time, my 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 initial conversation with them is I used to be an underwriter. I understand what you're going through. you got a thousand submissions. Here's what I'm going to promise to you. I'm going to give you as much information as I can in a timely fashion. I understand you got other people waiting for you to give them the give them the same attention you're giving me. I'm not going to spin your wheels and I hope you don't do the same to me. But on the other side of that coin, you hit the nail on the head. If if you got someone who's, if you got a, a, an insured or a prospect who's marketing their account every year, underwriters mm -hmm. remember that. And they are very reluctant to, to, to take a look at that account when they know they're going to have to put a lot of capital up front in it only to lose it the next year because all they have is a price pusher. So just just like you guys, we we do our due diligence up front, and it's something that we've seen that they shop every year. You know, outside of one certain industry, and I won't name it because that's just the nature of the beast with them. We tell them thanks a lot, but we we think you're a better fit for another agency down the road. Yeah, and you know what? We'll call the client out. I mean, Kyle's heard me do it in a prospect meeting, and I'll ask him right to their face. Do you understand that you are damaging your reputation in the insurance market? Absolutely, because you know what. They don't. 
Most uh, no, a hundred percent of yeah. them do not. Yeah, mo- most of the time the client has no clue, and that's where I see a problem. It, it's so funny. I just had a call earlier today with a guy that was telling me he called me, found me online, whatever, booked some time, wanted to get some uh, some some advice. Was talking to me about maybe coming into killing commercial training program because he wants to write middle market business. And I knew it wasn't going to be a fit for him for a couple of reasons. Nice enough guy and definitely has the ability to be successful. But he walked me through some deals because I, that's one of the things I ask people is tell me about some of the stuff you're working on, what's going on, what are the roadblocks you're running into? Because if I can't bring value to anybody, I'm not going to take money from right. them for it. I want to be able to get their life back. Mm-hmm. And so he told me, he's like, well, what would you do in this situation? He's like, I'm in this account right now. It's a um, about 65000 in premium. It's an HVAC contractor, and it's me and three other agencies competing on it. I'm like, you're not going to hear what I would do. Right. <laughs> I said, I'd, wa- I'd walk away yeah. from it. You know, I said, there's two things. I said, number one, I want you to understand something. If I've had a conversation with them and that situation still exists, I'm out. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I will at least give them the benefit of the doubt to have the first meeting in the conversation because what I know is our industry has conditioned people that that is how you were supposed to and buy. It's so wrong. That's that's our fault. Yeah. Okay, so right. give me the opportunity to educate you. Let me tell you there's a different way. Let me help you understand what's going on and why all of this bull crap where you're taping over the numbers mm-hmm. of your premium and then scanning it to me or it's the best. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or, you know, you've got three other agents and all of us only have so many markets we can go to. We're blindly competing against each other. We're trying to leverage terms and conditions. Right. And I mean, no disrespect yeah. to you whatsoever, Mr. Prospect, but you are the least qualified of all of us that are involved in this to analyze this situation. Right. And you're not going to get the best deal. No. So what you need, what I recommend that you do is you let all of us come in and lay out how we would attack your plan and then Pick the one that works for exactly. you. Then let us go to the marketplace. Let us leverage the underwriters against each other to make sure that we get the best overall value for you in the program mm-hmm. and get the insurance piece behind us. That's right. Because that's where the issue is. So many people, if you walked into a CFO right now and you ask them, tell me how many hours a year or how much of your, yeah, how many hours a year you put into, if you had to project your insurance and risk management function of your business. And they'll give you some sort of a number. They'll probably say, I don't even know how I could guess that. Hmm. Just give me a number, right? And then my next question is, how much of that time as a percentage is in the 30 to 60 days prior to your insurance Mm renewal? And almost every single time, it's 95%. So you're telling me that for 10 months out of the year, we're only getting 5% of your attention? That's a problem. That's a very big problem. And that's because we're selling paper instead of solving problems. Mm -hmm. And that's why when we go in, we position ourselves in front of an account, we make ourselves the outsourced risk manager for that account. So they get 12 months a year coverage Mm -hmm. as opposed to just focusing on it, the the 30, 60, 90 days around renewal. That's why they have bad uh, performance problems is because once the insurance is over with, we're done for the year. We're out. We'll talk to you next year at renewal or whatever else. Yeah. And and that's bad. Mm-hmm. That's that's definitely that, that and that's wrong on them. If they're like you said, if they're dedicating that small of time to just the insurance, it, it comes to show that they're 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 not they're they're just worrying about getting it out of the way and not touching it again. And that's wrong. Well, and the thing is too, I think that a lot of times too, when you're in businesses that are in that lower end of the middle market or whatever, um, you know, you're you're dealing with people who may need a level of sophistication, they quite frankly can't provide for themselves. Mm-hmm. So if a company's grown or whatever else, they may not realize, you know, one of our number one wedges that we drive when we go in and talk to people is around return to work. Return to work has a black eye out in the workplace because people think it's counting paper clips or filing stuff to punish somebody who got injured mm-hmm. on the job. Mm-hmm. It's not about bringing the employee back and getting them integrated into the culture and making sure that they're not out laying on their couch watching, you know, plaintiff's attorney's ads while they're injured. It's getting them back, getting them acclimated and doing something that's productive for both them and the business. Absolutely. You know, it's crazy to think that companies don't even know what that means and the level of impact that it has on a workers' comp claim if you can get that person back without indemnity on. Yeah. And 
almost none of the people that we talk to have any clue what the actual impact yeah. is. They think that they've got the return to work program, but there's nothing formalized and they have zero idea how it impacts their mod and, and their 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 and, risk in general. Well, Kyle's been, yeah, Kyle's been sitting in meetings with me before. I'm a freaking bulldozer, man. When they tell, because I'll ask him, I'll ask him, hey man, tell me about your- Oh, oh, oh you got a return to work program? You got one, buddy? <laughs> that's so let's that's it. it. Yeah, I'm basically saying, all right, whip it out. Let me see what let's it looks see like. It. That's so, right. Yeah. But no, I, I do. I mean, oh, so I don't. I'm not that obnoxious about it. But 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 I basically ignore. I basically ignore them when they tell me they do. Uh, and my and my follow up to that is, oh, so what you're telling me is you do have a formalized chart that has the responsibilities for who's responsible for what in the event that there's a workers comp claim and you need to bring somebody back. And you do have the letter that's part of the claims packet that you send to the treating physician to make sure they understand that you're a return to work employer. And they're also going to remember that because you've gone over and personally introduced yourself to begin to develop a relationship with that clinic to make them understand mm -hmm. that this is a sincere initiative that you have. Mm -hmm. And you also have. Well. Yeah. And, and, and so the guy all of a sudden that had the return to work program, I'm about three bullet points in and they have. I mean, you can just hear in headlights. Yeah, completely. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. But that's how, that's how we win business. And then when you get into the, how the financial implications affect everything, it's a no brainer. Well, absolutely. Yeah, and you've pretty much sold them with the return to work program and financial at that point is kind of a second hand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole thing. I mean, in that entire conversation that I just gave you, I bet you I've closed probably 40% of the business I've ever written in my entire career. And not one time in what I said to you, did I mention the word insurance or the word policy? Right. Not once. Yep. Right. And that's where agents need to shift where they're thinking. Because here's what we know. And you know this. You understand loss picks and backing into rate and all of that. You had to do it as an Absolutely. underwriter. You can only get the price of a policy so low. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. So why is that what we negotiate? But there's a whole bunch of other stuff that contributes to what's happening to that policy. It's a lot of back office. That's, that's also costing the company money, mm -hmm. right? Indirect cost of claims, cost of risk management staff. You know, I can go on and on and on, but the client doesn't know that. And why don't they know that? Because they don't spend enough time on this because we don't require them to. We've condition them that they can spend a little bit of time around renewal to deal with it. And anything outside of that's going to be covered by insurance if it happens anyhow. So they just file the claims as they happen instead of trying to control them or eliminate them. And they wonder why their renewal is bad at the end of the year. Yep. Yep. And that's when they start shopping and price shopping and shotgunning at everyone else. When, when like you said, you, you, we're fishing from the same pond. Most agents, 90% of agents have the same carriers. And at that time, it just boils down to who the customer is going to work with, who the customer is going to work with. That's it. Mm -hmm. So I've got an interesting question for you because I've written some pretty good sized furniture accounts. And in furniture comes Ocean Marine. Yes. What's the worst claim you've ever had to deal with as an underwriter when you were writing Ocean Marine? Oh, man. Um, the, the most interesting one would probably, the most interesting story I've heard would probably be uh, there was a shipment of, cigarettes coming uh it was down in florida actually and the russians got them well th th this is where it gets interesting so guy pulls up at the stoplight uh beside him is a lady in a convertible she looks at him blows him a kiss he looks over at her his passenger side door is unlocked of his cab two masked gunmen gets in the truck and said let's go for a ride they they uh they, they make him drive they ride around for a couple of hours and then blindfold him tie him up, put him in the back, continues to ride around. Fast forward 24 hours, he's in the back. They told him, if you make any noise or get out or do anything, we're going to kill you. He finally said, you know what? I'm, yeah, <laughs> what? He, he finally said, I'm going to fight or flight. They were gone. By the time he, he got unloosed and unblindfolded, the cab of that truck was gone. It, it, it was a significant claim to those cigarettes being stolen. <laughs> it's so yes, crazy. Yes, it's nuts, man. It's dude, that's straight out of Goodfellas. Oh yeah, yes. Yeah. And then uh, obviously, you, I, 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 you guys probably remember all of the piracy that used to go on when they when they oh, were yeah. hijacking ships and stuff. That that's real, man. It, it still happens. Um, there's still shipments in certain countries that you know you you got to pay a ransom to that local government because it's organized crime. And if not your shipment, everyone that goes through there is going to get stolen if you don't pay that ransom. 
Listen, one of the most ridiculous accounts that I have ever produced in my entire career and one of the most awesome accounts that I've ever produced in my entire career was a company that was formed by about 40 or 50 ex special forces guys uh. that bought that bought some boats and mounted barrets to the hull of the boats and they patrolled the areas where the pirates were picking them off so the boats could go through. I covered that. Wow. That's amazing. What? Yeah. That had to be an interesting account. Yeah, I think Kyle was probably at recess when that happened because he was maybe in like he was probably in like second or third grade when all that went down. Oh man, I wish I was still at recess. I hear you. That's those were the days. Those were the days. Nap time, recess, snacks, oh, yes. all that stuff. Yes, and lunch. So we were talking. Yeah, right. We were talking a little bit offline before um, we started recording. Everything you're talking about the makeup of your agency and how it started commercial, then mm-hmm. transitioned. Um, it, well, the, the personal lines was more of just like a rounding out, but then you kind of made the m- made the move to go full bore mm-hmm. into it. What like what was your thought process process behind that? What had was there a trigger event? Yeah. What's so uh, when I first started uh, the agency, my goal was to be a, an ocean marine broker. And the, the city that mm-hmm. I'm in, Fort Mill, they're, they're still one of the largest, the, the fastest growing cities in South Carolina and Metro Charlotte. And, you know, with new houses, that's low hanging fruit to a lot of uh, to a lot of, of uh, home home and you know, personalized companies. And so I started doing the commercial lines and people were saying, well, hey, why don't you take a look at my my home and auto to round, round that portion out? And, you know, that light bulb went off. Well, you know, you get a person's commercial account and then you have their personal, you know, they're, they're less they're less likely to, to move a portion of it from you because they, they have one point of contact for everything. And so that started growing. And as mm-hmm. Fort Mill started growing, I was like, you know, what? this this is really this. This is a gold mine. You know, there's a lot of realtors here. There's a lot of lenders, still a lot of home building, you know, c- can get a, a really good book, of personalized business going. And, you know, that that would be enough to pay the bills every month. So um, and, you know, once you once you get it going, it's like building a house, start with the foundation. And the next thing you know, you, you have a good book of it. And it, it just ballooned from there. Nice. We like to just throw out ads on YouTube and get crazy amounts of leads. <laughs> I hear you, man. <laughs> now, listen, I, you know, that's so, it was so funny because we had Nick on the podcast and we were talking about it. But I mean, that's like a legendary deal inside of his YouTube ad program because we just it, we didn't have any processes. Yeah. We had no processes in place for personal lines. Yeah. And, you know, I think that sometimes people think, oh, well, you know, I'm big, bad Johnny commercial. I can handle anything in the insurance world. Nah, not so not much, so much. Man. It's, that's a right. whole different animal. I mean, us opening personal lines is one of the most humbling experiences I've ever had mm-hmm. in my life because we just didn't have processes. Thankfully, now a lot of that's fixed, and I but I still don't have the guts to turn the ads back on yet because we just got absolutely <laughs> destroyed. It was yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah, it, it's nuts, man. We we really we've really been fortunate. Um, we we have a good bit of referral partners uh, that that refers a lot of stuff over to us. Anyone who we write a commercial policy for, we uh, as soon as we write their policy, we tell them you're now a referral partner to where you get an entry into our monthly drawing of a hundred dollars, and we always do a video and highlight mm-hmm. who it is. Um, and so it, it it just comes in now. And, and over the years, um, I, cre- I I created our own website here, company website, and and just learned SEO from listening to other agents and you know, other industries and, you know, w- with the Google reviews and the web pages now, stuff just comes in, man. So we're, we're, we're really fortunate. Personal lines for us is, is definitely growing, but you're right. It's, it's definitely, it's definitely a different animal than the commercial, commercial. Well, it, well, the referral, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing if you're getting referrals, it's another thing if yeah. you're getting cold ads, mm-hmm. you get ad traffic. Right. right? Mm-hmm. And I think that's the biggest thing that we underestimated when we launched I'm not saying that going out and writing the referral business is any easier, but, you know, our issue was we didn't have the follow up mechanisms in place to create the tickets and the tasks to make sure we actually got a hold of these. Mm -hmm. people. And that's that's what blows my mind. These people went in, they watched the ad, they clicked the button, they filled out a survey that they were interested. And then you call them back and it's like, I didn't do that. Yeah. (laughs) Or or like. There's nobody, you know, they're, they're not around er- anywhere. You know, we're texting them, we're um, calling them, e- emailing them, everything we can do. 
And it's like you're having to just – you're killing so much time mm-hmm. to try and get a hold of them. And I mean the agencies that do really, really well, like I'm talking about crazy volume and personal lines, their processes are, lock, are locked down. Yes. The, the nice part about writing you know, larger commercial stuff in the middle market is you don't have volume. Right. You know, you, you, I mean, in terms of policy count. And so a lot of that's a that's a good thing. And it's a bad thing. I mean, if you don't have policy count and you lose one and it's, you know, a high revenue per policy in your agency, it's going to stay. Mm-hmm. But on the flip side, you know, I tell people all the time, if we write two dozen middle market accounts in a year, we've had an epic year. That's awesome. That is awesome. You know, because now I'm, I'm, you know, two accounts a month, I can bring in 750 to, you know, 1.25 million in revenue Mm -hmm. based on who we prospect and how we go there. And that's a whole lot easier than dealing with 2,400 personal lines policies. I just can't even imagine. Yes. Yes. I I think both, I think both, uh, lines of coverages they, they they have their advantages and disadvantages like you said you know definitely the commercial you know that that's my background and that's where that's where i'm more comfortable at and you know you're right the, the larger policies they definitely help um on the other side of that coin it it, it, it hurts if it ever gets to that point where if we lose one you know then, then you look at the personal mm-hmm. line side it's that law of large numbers it's you know day in day out rinse and repeat and then go and find the next one you know so i, I i'm with you on that man we, we've been fortunate, though. You know, our goal is to get probably 70 percent commercial, 30 percent personal, but still have that commercial lines, that commercial lines uh, business continuing to grow, not shrink it. But, you know, just just both of them kind of like a cylinder, both go up at the same time. Yeah, I mean, if you've got if you've got 70 percent commercial and 30 percent personal, mm-hmm. lines, you've probably got an equal number of policies on the personal line side as you do on the commercial. It's just the revenue per policy high enough on the commercial that it makes it go higher. So you're really well balanced. And I mean, I, I really think. I, I don't know, man, you know, I, I, I did it the hard way. I did it where I was only going after the bigger commercial stuff. That's how I built my agency. Yeah. But I think that I, I wonder sometimes what it would have been like if I would have started in personal lines first and then moved up. I, I'm completely foreign to personal lines. Mm-hmm. I, I walked into an agency the first day I walked in and they said, go produce accounts that are 250 to 500,000 in premium. Great. How do I do that? Well, that's up to you to figure out. But if you find somebody who's willing to talk to you, we can help you with the insurance part of it. I think it's probably easier to, and I say easier, I don't know if that's mm-hmm. the right term, but. Going from the the commercial to the personal in, instead of the other way around because of the conversation that you're having. If you in the personal lines, in my experience, which is not very vast, but in, in the experience that I do have, it's a completely different mm-hmm. conversation and it's very price driven. Whereas we've talked about already on on this episode here, you know, on the commercial side, it's it's value driven and it's a much different conversation. I think you're able to to morph a little bit better into the personal lines and having that conversation starting with the value conversation that you've learned from the commercial side versus the other way around, if that makes sense. I think it does. You're right. Once you're, once you're, you're trained, once your brain is trained to, to take price out of the equation on a commercial account, if you morph that into onto the personal side, it's easier to, to sell a personal policy because then, you know, is someone going to, if you've got a great relationship with someone, they're less likely to, to move from you over a $5 a month difference in price sure. because they have that relationship and they understand the relationship is more important than the premium, right. than the premium, whatever it would be. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Well, yeah. And I mean, I think that the other thing too is for everybody that's listening to this, shaking your head, getting ready to send me hate mail, that price does matter. I'm not saying price is irrelevant. I'm just saying that I'm not basing my sale on that price. Of course you know, I mean, we're, we're paying attention Correct. to price. And in many cases, we're getting our clients a better deal. I'm just not going to sell to them based on that because they'll leave me based on that. If exactly. I sell them, back yourself into you corner, you've got no other option. That's, That's right. the only thing you're if, delivering. If you live by the price, you die by the price. We, we tell people, you know, all the time, you know, we built our book on relationship versus price versus insurance 
insurance, a lot of times when we go to talk to someone is the third aspect. We want to know who they are, how they started, what their thought process is uh, of how their business is working, whether they see themselves in the next couple of years. And after we get all of that info, that's when we go into the insurance and figure out, OK, well, what's your pain points? Price is hardly ever is is, is never in the equation. Mm -hmm. Or if, or, once, yeah, or once if we it get, is, yeah, or if it is in the equation, mm -hmm. then you're going to ask the secondary questions and direct them to see that that price is actually the product of something that is a pain point that they may not even have identified. Mm -hmm. True. Exactly. That's exactly right. You know, and, and coverage is. You know, from being on the underwriting side, coverages are, are certainly key. You know, we tell people you get what you pay for. You want a cheaper policy. Let's take a look at it and see what's all there. Mm -hmm. And if it's if it's not going to be if it's not beneficial to what you need, what's the use of paying for a policy that's not going to respond when you want it to? Yeah, I yep. agree. Well, and I mean, the other thing, too, is, again, as agents, our number one job should be as an educator, period. These people mm -hmm. are not, as right. I think that sometimes, and I'm probably guilty of this to a certain degree myself, but I think sometimes we walk into these appointments and we're talking to somebody as if we're on the same level with them, when we might as well be walking in and talking in Portuguese or something because they don't have a clue what That's it right. is that we're saying. And so they get intimidated by that or they get defensive by that. I've always tried to mm -hmm. take the approach where I explain to them what things mean and, you know, I'll give you an example. I don't care if people take risk. I want them to. If they need if they need to take mm -hmm. risk to control cost, I want them to do that. I'll be an advocate for them taking risk. But I want them to take risk that's calculated. I want them to take risk that's quantifiable, right? I don't want somebody taking yes. risk on general liability by buying low limits or not buying an umbrella and self-insuring for everything mm -hmm. above the limits of the policy. What I'd rather them do yeah. is take that same general liability policy and put a $5,000 deductible on it. And at least mm. you know that you're on the hook for that 5000 Or I'd rather you take your building that you don't have any note on. And I'm not saying I'm advocating they do this. I'm just saying that they know what they're getting into. And it's an educated decision. If you decide you well, don't want to... It is that it's quantifiable. You, they know what they're risking. You have yeah. a half, you're laying you the have cards a half on the table. Yeah. building and you don't want to put insurance on it, and the wind comes, guess what? You know that you could lose a half a million dollars. That's right. your decision to make if you don't want it. Sure. That's absolutely. So I don't know. It's just, it's interesting because I see so much of that stuff. And even with like limits, like I've, I've gone in and, and called on accounts that have fleets of vehicles that have $10,000 combined single limits on the vehicles. And it's like 25, 30 trucks. Nobody ever stopped to take the time to explain to them what that was, it was an agent that wanted to hit it and quit it. They went in, they got the deal done, they collected a commission check and, and kept going. Meanwhile, this this person's entire livelihood that is, it, is right. at risk. Mm -hmm. Then on mm -hmm. the other side of that coin, yeah. you've got the guys that are like, well, you know, I don't care. I'll buy low limits. And if somebody sues me, I'll just shut down the LLC and open another one. Right. Which are not people we want to deal with anyways. But I had a, I had an yeah. example the the your previous statement of I walked in it was it was somebody who I had cold called I I did some research on their mod ended up um, putting them with a different carrier on the comp um, that was going to offer them a dividend they were in the wrong class code so it was like there was a whole bunch of things wrong and and you know he he afterwards was like you know you you're the first person who's ever come in and even told me anything like that I mean why was my agent not why did they have me in the wrong class code for workers comp? Why, why are they not looking out for me? So then it transitioned into the auto. I get his auto. He's got 10, 20 limits. Now he didn't have a fleet of, of 20 or 30 vehicles or whatever. I think there was like five or six, but still, I'm, I, you know, that, that that's, that's no chump change. I'm, I'm like, dude, you realize you have 10, 20 limits. Like you're basically covered if a shopping cart, you know, hits you in the, in the parking lot. <laughs> like, and, and so, wow. right. So he ended up, bumping up his limits because renewal had just happened or something like that. But I, I ended up getting the business the next year because, um, because I had that conversation. Yeah. We didn't, came, you didn't even write the account the first year. He went back to his no. other agent, told him yeah. to up the yeah. limits, but it because yeah. it was such a tight window, but kept in contact right. with him. And it, that next year at renewal, he just added it to what we represent them for. So, 
Exactly. But it goes back to what you just said about educating the, the client. I think that's how you sell. I think people disguise it as, you know, or have sales uh, and selling and insurance wrapped up in their head in some, you know, um, crazy elaborate manner where you've got to, you've got to be like the used car salesman. No, like you, sales is just educating the person, educating the buyer. Like why, that's it. You, know, you know, you know, why you have something that's going to help them, whether it's a, a product or a deliverable, you know, the value. And and, and, mm-hmm. and that's it. I think part of the, you know, I you think know, part of the issue that best does stuff down here too is the fact that we're a, a no fault state and it's ten ten thousand um, dollar, you know, ten twenty ten is the minimum that you have to have to get your plate. And people think, oh well, that's what the state requires us to have, and that should be enough. In terms right. That's all we need. You know, in, in our agency, we won't write anything under 100, 300, 100. and I really prefer to write two fifty five or a five hundred combined single limit because we want to also write the umbrella and you're going to have to have the limits in order to get that anyhow. But I mean, you you can take Mm -hmm. people and that's what's crazy is you take people who really don't have bad driving records. They've got reasonable credit and everything else. They just bought insurance from a call center and they were Mm -hmm. focused on the price and they didn't realize until somebody took the time to explain it to them. And you do it in such a way to where they're not defensive, right? Like I tell, I tell right. people, yes. I'm going to try and raise somebody's limits. I'm going to go in and say, look, I'm all about you taking risk. I want you to be able to calculate it. I want it to be quantifiable. Here are the areas that you can have the ability to make that kind of a decision. However, over here, don't do it. It doesn't make sense for you mm-hmm. to do that. And your client appreciates that. I have a client that's a, that is an actual personal friend of mine. I've represented them for over 15 years now. They own a manufacturing facility here in Tampa, a non-combustible metal building, absolutely horrible from a ratings perspective. And, you know, they never carried business income. And I told them, I said, you really need at least a million and a half in business income for what you have. I'm eyeballing it. Here's the business income worksheet. Fill it out. Let's see where the number comes back. It was almost dead on the money at a million and a half. And then he started pushing me. He's like, I can't believe that it's going to cost me this much. I said, I'm digging my heels in on this one. You need the coverage. Don't, Don't gripe at me about price. This is something you have to buy to protect your asset. Mm -hmm. And I said, in your limits, I said, and here's one way we can fix some of that. This is early on. Here's one way we can fix some of that. All of this equipment you have is permanently attached to the building. I don't know why it's being rated as contents. It should be rated under the building itself, you know, because you get a better rate that way. And I said, so we're going to pick up some efficiency over here. Let's apply some of that money. Well, he didn't do it the first year, but then the next year I went back at him even harder. And he he said, you know what? I'm tired of listening to you. I'm just going to do it and trust that you know what you're talking about, which he was, that was his way of being smart. He knew I, I knew what I was talking about. Well, guess what happened? Freaking hurricane mm-hmm. came in and ripped the building to shreds, and they were down for eighteen months. If he hadn't bought that business, wow, if he hadn't bought that business income, he'd have lost his whole company. But instead, they're they're oh, yeah. still up and running and growing year after year. And that's the difference. I mean, you have to number one, you have to be able to educate them. But number two, if you believe the advice you are giving is the best advice for that person, you have to have conviction about that. And be willing to stand up for what you agree, you know, what you, what you're telling them your advice is. And don't let clients bulldoze you just because they can end up, you know, you'll get a paycheck from it. You also can get an ENO yeah. lawsuit from it too, if you're not careful and the paycheck doesn't matter anymore. That is true. You, you know, we tell customers, we we uh, I tell people here, you have to explain insurance to someone as if you're explaining it to a five-year-old. And not a five-year-old belittling them, but explain it as if you're trying to give specific instructions on a five-year-old what they're supposed to do to where they can understand it. And once you do that, that's that's the golden rule. Once someone can understand it, like you said, to where if they're not feeling intimidated, but it's, it's giving them it's giving them examples and 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 claim scenarios of what could possibly happen, then they're more comfortable with you and. That price, you know, that equation of price gets a little bit further down, down, down the road to where they're not thinking about price. It's, oh, this person's taking the time to explain this to me to where I understand it. 
even if I'm paying a little bit more, I've never had someone do that. And, you know, with us being the specialist, that's what they're looking to us for. But at the same time, they're, they're, they're more comfortable with us when we do that. Yeah, I agree. It's, um, it's crazy. I've written a lot of life sciences business over the course of my career and reviewing uh, protocols and informed consent documents for these companies that are having clinical trials for med devices or pharma products. It is crazy because best practices for that industry clearly says you need to have your informed consent written to a sixth grade reading level. And if it's anything more than that, people are not going to understand what it is you're trying to tell them. And you're going to end up having mm -hmm. a higher likelihood of having claims as a result of that. I was telling somebody, I don't mm -hmm. remember who it was. I was talking to somebody yesterday and I, and they were, they were, um, talking about producing content or whatever else. And I, I told him, I said, you need to go buy the Hemingway editor. I mean, because if you buy the Hemingway app for your computer, every time you write something, if you paste it into Hemingway, it's going to take it and it's going to just absolutely shred it, but make you write in small, easy to understand sentences. And so that's a, that's a way to do that. And so, I, I mean, look, when I wrote my book, I, I ran it through the Hemingway editor. Holy crap, man. Like the first <laughs> I can't even imagine how many times it shot you down. Oh, it was it's horrible. Like, it was no, terrible. Wow. Yeah. And then you throw it into Grammarly and it's like the sentence is too short. It should be. I mean, so whatever. But right. yeah. yeah. But you have to be <laughs> careful how you're communicating. So you said you like to cold call. You said you like to hunt, man. Tell us the trick. What's the number one move that you have when you're out prospecting or going after something to get them to meet with you? Absolutely. So. When, when I first started, I, I would just get in my truck. I had brochures. I would just go into somewhere and say, hey, uh, say who I was, what I'm doing. And uh, I would start asking them, you know, questions about, you know, th their personal life. When is their birthday? Where they're from? Something that's going to get me uh, something that's going to uh, get me something that I can take back and say I can relate to that. Um, I'll give you a story. The, the biggest customer, one of the biggest customers I have now, I cold called on them. They didn't even open the door. They came outside and said, what do you want? We're not no soliciting. I went back three months later with a dozen donuts. I said, I'm going to sweeten you guys up today. They let me in that time and I was going after their per their commercial insurance. They called me back three months later and said, our house insurance is up for renewal. What can you do? There you go. So at that point, I, I, I looked at their homeowner insurance and saved them 30 percent. So you trade off the rip. Krispy Kreme donuts. It's that. Krispy Kreme donuts that. is the trick. <laughs> the way to a person's heart is through their stomach a lot of times. And so it's with either food or sweetening them up. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, uh, I'm big on birthdays. I'm big on birthdays. And I'm a big numbers guy. Um, we, we have a, uh, a birthday uh, card program here to where all of our customers that are, that are scheduled drivers or the, the owners of the policies, we send them a birthday card with a uh, Starbucks gift card. And so, uh, before we were doing that, we sent the lady and her husband a birthday card. And you, you have to take in mind, this lady is the gatekeeper. She is like straight up. I'm not talking to anyone. If I don't know you, what do you want? You're just trying to take our money. And so I got a call one afternoon. She said, come to my office. And I was like, well, what did I do? You know, I'm thinking, oh, man, I know I'm in trouble. I get there and she tells me, do you know we've been with our current agent on our commercial policies for the last 10 years and not once did we ever get a birthday card? Here it is. You wrote our homeowner insurance. We know you wanted the commercial. You sent me and my husband a birthday card. Here's our entire book of policies. Take it and go and find something else for me. There you go. It's yours. And so, you know, Going back to what you asked, my key is the, the tricks to what we do, obviously the Krispy Kreme donuts. But, you know, people like to be remembered. People like to be treated as as if they're the best thing since sliced bread, just like I do. You know, and, and we treat people we treat people with the utmost respect and we treat them as if we've known them our entire life. Um, insurance is, is out the equation. A lot of times we're just getting to know someone and We'd rather have them as a referral partner of who they can refer us to, even if we don't get their business. And so, you know, a lot of times the cold calling work, the donuts work, et cetera. It sounds a lot like there's this book. I didn't, it's like the two minute drill. <laughs> or, uh, like, get out of here, man. Okay. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. I boil it down this way to my boys. When, when, my, when my oldest son says, Dad, what is it that you really do for a living? I said, I get paid to make friends. That's it. 
That's it. That's right. And, and my clients, some of my, I'm friends with all of my clients, but my clients are some of my best friends at this point, you know? Yes. And the overwhelming mm-hmm. majority of my book of business, my personal book has been with me over a decade, you know, and it's, mm-hmm. it, it's, that's what it's all about, man. I don't mind coming to work every day. And if something happens that's bad to their business, I take that personally. I want to do everything I can to make sure that they're made whole. I'm going to fight with claims adjusters. I'm going to do everything that I need to do to make sure that I'm delivering on all the promises that they perceive. I can deliver mm-hmm. on, you know, based on those relationships. So I think that's awesome, man. And yeah. I mean, it's crazy. We overcomplicate so much. Out of everything you just said, all I took away from the last 45 minutes was send my clients a birthday card. That's it. Zero, zero insurance. There you go. None. Zero what? Zero what? None. Yeah. Like zero about insurance or sales or anything like that. It's just about creating that relationship and have, you know, giving them a reason to remember you, you know? Well, absolutely. Yeah. So when we had our Christmas party a couple years ago, we had it at the Florida aquarium and I had a backdrop and we took pictures of everybody as they came in. Number one, I had them all sign a photo release before I would do it. And on that photo release, I got their name, address, all of the stuff on the spreadsheet. And there was a method to that madness, but as people came in, you know, people were, um, you know, dressed up nicer than they typically are, blah, blah, blah. You know, some of my clients are contractors and things like that. So for them to be out with their spouse in a nice event, you know, for a night on the town, it's not not necessarily normal. So when I hired a professional photographer, every time somebody came in, they filled out the information. He got a shot of them in front of the backdrop. Now the backdrop did have Florida Risk Partners on it, just like you would expect. Um, But, you know, yeah. And so what we did was I, I told him I would pay him extra if he could at least get – he did video work and other things. But I said if you could get the entry pictures done, get those edited and over to me within 24 hours, I'll give you a bonus. And so he did. And then we have an application called Send Out Cards that I use on my phone. And I, I uploaded oh, yeah. all of those pictures and I created Christmas cards thanking all of these people for coming to our holiday party. But on the cover of the card, it was their formal picture in front of the backdrop. And every single person got their own card because it would be weird if you got somebody else's, you know, but yeah. by when, but we had our, <laughs> we had our party on a Saturday night and by Tuesday or Wednesday of the following week, they had already gotten their customized Christmas card with their name on it. And I can't tell you how many people reached out to me telling me how cool it was that we were able to do that or what wow. a sneaky dog I was for getting their address so that I could send it to them without them realizing what I was doing. But I mean, it, again, man, mm-hmm. it all goes back to how you make people feel, period. That's it. That's it. A person will, will always a person will will always remember how you made them feel. Agreed. Agreed. And I, I, I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to attempt to botch it and you may know it, but my Angelou had a great quote about that. And I don't remember the quote word for word. Now, if I were Ryan Hanley, I would just go ahead and spit it out or Jason Cass and it would be completely wrong and not care, but I'm, I'm going right. to save myself the embarrassment and just admit I need to go look the quote back up again. Yeah. Look it up yourself, people. It's a well, me too. I, I I paraphrased it earlier because I couldn't remember the entire thing. So you, you're not. There you go. Stuff. Well, listen, man. I'm going to be respectful <laughs> of your time. It's the end of the day. We've been going an hour. Honestly, it's been a, a pleasure talking to you. I know we interact back and forth on social. I've never met you in person yet. Look forward to that. I'm hoping you're coming down to Tampa um, in the spring. Absolutely. And just so that you know. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm going to start putting this out on more and more podcasts, but uh, we're going to do a full one day workshop on commercial insurance for free the day before innovation starts on that Wednesday. And then that Wednesday night, we've rented out the Florida Aquarium for a private reception for people that are podcast guests, people in Killing Commercial. And I don't know, maybe if you're special and you're a one off, I'll invite you too. But I want to let you know, we'd love to have you there, um, you know, in April when you come down and look forward to seeing you in person. Thanks for the offer. I appreciate that. I certainly look forward to it. All right, man. Well, listen, tell them how to find you so because people are going to want to reach out. If nothing else, you're probably the only guy they've ever heard talk about Ocean Marine. So they may have a question there, but let them know. Uh, let them know how to get a hold of you if they want to talk to you. Absolutely. So the website is uh, www.crosswindsinsurance.com. 
I'm also on LinkedIn, Renato Robinson. Um, luckily for me, there's not many uh, people named Renato Robinson in the world. And so if you put in Renato Robinson on any uh, search engine, I'll probably be one of the first three to come up. There you go. Sounds good, man. Well, listen, thanks again for your time. It's been great talking to you. Wish you nothing but the best, brother. Same here, brother. I appreciate you. Thanks a lot. You've been listening to the Power Producers Podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes, and our website, killingcommercial.com. <laughs>